economics took a different turn from it, the last few decades of, of the 20th century so that there's a much greater focus on models as providing the full argument. And uh, people were lulled into a sense of security by what's called the Great Moderation, which was a period, a long period of stability, steady growth. Various people were making statements, we've got it cracked, no more issues to, to be addressed. Um, so the crisis was a huge, huge shock. Even though people were starting to say that, pri that risk pricing was going awry mm -hmm. in financial markets. Nevertheless, there was this confidence. I mean, because that framework is based on a notion of equilibrium and markets being able always to bring um, situations back to equilibrium, there seemed to be this blind confidence that the same would happen again. OK, the, there's a bit of mispricing, we have to deal with that, but equilibrium will be restored. And, I mean, you ask about the current situation. The crisis itself was regarded as a problem of mispricing due to impediments to market forces. So all the solutions now coming from mainstream economics are couched in these terms. How to reconfigure incentives, how to reconfigure constraints on destabilising activity, how to make information more transparent so markets can make decisions better. So, some of, I mean, a lot of the, the thinking that's gone into bank regulation has been very constructive, but the underlying thought processes are still in line with what went before, and the expectation is we can sort this so that it won't happen again. Well, the appropriate response requires a whole lot of back, back work, mm. which, which means um, A, understanding the limitations of models and therefore being alert to when those limitations are really going to be important. B, having a really good knowledge of the history of the situation, the, the institutional framework, the current context, um, in order to deal with having to make a judgment quickly when conventional models are, are inadequate. So a, a lot of it is about a alertness and consciousness and awareness. And that's, which was, that's something that was clearly very much lacking. It's inevitable with something as complex as society and economies within society that there are going to be different perspectives, there are going to be different understandings of the way the world works, and therefore, uh, I mean, there's bound to be simplification, abstraction, and therefore scope for different choices as to how one goes about that, which of course is, is um, it's inevitable, but B, it's, it's very helpful if this is fostered, because then we get an understanding of the whole. Yes, I, I mean, the idea of a school of thought is in a way, um, it's a category like any other category. It's a way of, of encapsulating something very complex. So that, for example, I call myself a post-Keynesian. That's shorthand for the way I use language, uh, the concepts I use, and, and so on. Um, and I'll have arguments with post-Keynesians. Um, many people don't like being put in a school of thought because they differ in various ways. But I find it a hugely helpful shorthand which aids communication, that you know where somebody's coming from, if you know what school of thought they're identified with. Um, but I also think it's helpful to dig a bit deeper than schools of thought. And for students, I think this is particularly important. So uh, in, the, in a way, before I approach the question of schools of thought, when I was trying to figure out how economists were thinking. I mean, this was what was driving a lot of my research. You know, why, why do economists get so excited about the slope of the IS curve? It, I mean, mm -hmm. I couldn't understand that. How, you know, what, what's getting them really excited? Um, and, and so I drilled down further to what um, uh, can be called mode of thought. I mean, Whitehead wrote about modes of thought. I mean, it's sort of... It's a, a, an old concept. 
Um, and I developed the idea that, um, I mean, that there are no doubt, and this is important, many modes of thought, but I picked on two. One I called the Cartesian Euclidean mode of thought and the other the Babylonian mode of thought. Um, and you'll see in a minute why it's important that I stress that, that there are more than two. Um, each has various characteristics. I mean, the, the Cartesian Euclidean mode of thought is axiomatic. It's what we, I, I would now call closed system, and that's a sort of a way of thinking about it that I developed subsequently. Um, and it involves dualism, which is why we need to recognise there's more than two schools of thought. You can imagine how people came back to me when I suggested that, the, that, it's, uh, that dualism is important. But um, with students, I mean, I've, uh, I think it's helpful to invite them to try to, and this is, is hard, but to try to think how they think. The alternative mode of thought, which um, I used as contrast, I, I used um, Feynman's Babylonian mathematics as a, an exemplar of, of a different way of thinking, which is not to start with axioms, but to start f for arguments to start with a problem and then different lines of argument to take different starting points, that there's no necessity to start one place rather than mm. another, that the starting point is determined by the nature of, of the problem. And you build up arguments um, using different um, trains of logic and different types of evidence and you may be noticing here, I mean it's very Keynesian actually, sharing the view that the, the social world is an open system and the economy within it is an, ocean, an open system and the, the way we think about it should be more along the lines of, of different strands of reasoning, drawing on, on different pieces of evidence and so on. Um, doesn't preclude the emergence of schools of thought, different understandings of what the nature of the real world is. And, and that immediately opens up um, possibilities to different schools of thought, which um, take, have different takes on what that methodology could, should consist of. So New Austrians would pick one type of reasoning and approach to evidence, Marxians would take another approach, post Keynesian another, and so on. Well, there are two big issues there. I mean, I'll, I'll deal with the anything goes one first, um, because this is a very frequent critique of, of pluralism. Um, at one level, at the epistemological level, it's possible to, at the level of theory of knowledge, it's possible to, um, and I would argue desirable, to recognise that there is scope for different systems of knowledge and there's, uh, and each should be respected in the sense that there, each is open to challenge. When it comes to developing from that schools of thought in economics, um, the range of possibilities inevitably has to be limited. I mean, it's something I've called structured pluralism. There has to be some structure. And it, this is for the purely logistical reason that a school of thought functions as a community. And there's only scope for so many communities. The way I was taught economics was in the old Scottish political economy tradition which is that everything is taught historically. I mean, if you go back to the time of Adam Smith, mathematics was taught historically. I mean, rather than teaching, you know, an approach as the best one, they would teach different approaches and, and show how um, different, different approaches to mathematics were useful in different contexts. And I would argue that this was tremendously helpful in, in the inventiveness in Scotland, that this, this encouraged lateral thinking. The students went out there equipped with the idea that there are different approaches and it was up to them to think through a particular problem, drawing on 
on different possibilities. So that's a long-winded way of, of answering your question, but this, this is the tradition which I was, I was taught, that we started, I, I still remember my first lecture in economics started with capital theory. I didn't understand it till later, but I, I mean, I obviously remembered it. And we were, and it also involved, we, we talked about the Greeks and ancient Greeks and Romans and thought then that, that informs us in economics now. And throughout the program, there was always this, it was taught with reference to history. It was taught with reference to methodology, mm -hmm. but not as something separate. It was just the way the material was presented. So th that was how, and, and I mean, I, w I was brought up in Scottish society. That's, that's how people approach things and why argument, not hostile argument, but just argument is such an important part of um, civil society in, uh, well, and religious society in Scotland. Um, so it comes naturally to me, but I, was, I became aware that it didn't come naturally to other people coming from different traditions. And in some ways it's trying to unpick that and figure out what, what was different, why, why I, I approached things the way I did that I tried to sort of draw back from that and, and analyse it. It depends how you understand the, the discipline. If you think of economics as a technical discipline, then that's what ought to be taught. But there are many other approaches to economics, and while a pluralist, I would nevertheless um, argue. I mean, pluralism doesn't mean not arguing by any means, I mean, going back to our discussion of anything goes, I mean, it, it means that you need to argue, actually. Um, that um, the technical approach to, to economics is, is very limited and um, students should be given the equipment to um, understand the history of economies, understand different um, different perspectives on the economy. Now, having said that, it, I don't think it's necessary to teach a full array of schools of thought. I mean, in advanced courses, there, there is scope for that. There are very simple things that can be done to just start students off in thinking in these terms just by exposing them to the possibility of other, one other school of thought even and not presenting that other as being the right one. In other words, not replacing one mainstream by another mainstream, but just starting off the idea that, it, that it's all contestable and that they, the students, can contest it. I mean, my teaching experience, the, the most effective thing um, I was able to do in my History of Thought methodology course, um, which I really... Uh, which the students actually used as a vehicle for talking about economics, um, was in the first seminar, I asked them to prepare a presentation on a piece of writing that they found interesting for some reason, either they liked it, didn't like it, or, or whatever. And they found, found that opened their minds. It was, it was quite remarkable. I mean, a few got it right from the beginning. But for many students, just the notion that they were invited to express an opinion about a piece of writing was liberating. And once they got that, we were off and running. No, there are better and worse ways of doing economics. And I am prepared to argue fiercely for what I think is the best way of doing economics. But I recognise that others have different views and and not only is it legitimate that others have different views but it's beneficial that they do because they bring something different to the table and enhance our understanding i mean i'm my understanding's clearly limited by my own perspective by nature i'm an optimist and i see signs for hope and partly it's because of the crisis that it has shaken things up and it has opened up awareness of the limitations of relying 
on formal models as the full argument. And it has encouraged a lot of work challenging mainstream economics around the edges. Um, so that's, that's really good. And at the same time, there's a groundswell of activism outside the mainstream, which is producing not only a body of, of thinking from different perspectives, but it's actually producing tangible um, materials on which economics of, of different perspectives can, can build. I mean, there's, there's lots of new teaching materials, lots of um, resources for research which are being built up. I mean, the student movement is, has been a, a hugely important part of this, and I, I regard that as a very hopeful sign. I mean, they've got a fantastic organisation. They're, they're producing lots of great material, and they're the next generation. Mm -hmm.